Welcome to Povercraft TV, where your creative soul gets to have fun. On today's show, we are going to Quebec, Canada, talk with the artist Leanne Chakra. She's going to be showing you her garden sculptures, which are amazing. And of course, she has prepared a tutorial just for you. You don't want to miss that. Then we are going to get to know more about one of the products of the Power Power line, a best tip, and of course, as usual, a very cool offer for you. So let's get started. Okay, I'm excited to talk to our artists today, but don't forget that on every show we make a very special offer. So take a peek at what I have here because we're going to talk more later. I now want to welcome Leanne Chakra. You are in Quebec, Canada, right? That's right, in the lovely area of the Eastern Townships. Oh, nice, nice. Outside of, uh, out of Montreal. Very good. So first of all, welcome to our show. Thank you so much for being here. So tell me a little bit uh, of your life as an artist. When did you get started? Well, um, I've always enjoyed art, but what uh, really got me started is um, working in the financial field. I really felt I had a lot of pressure and art was a way for me to kind of relax and, and enjoy the, um, the, the creative process. So I took my retirement uh, 10 years ago and um, saw someone who had made these absolutely beautiful bronze sculptures and I was fascinated by them. And I inquired with this particular artist what she was doing and she talked to me about Paverpal. Huh. So it was always in the back of my mind. And then I ended up taking some art classes at university and um, loved the aspect of sculpting. I had done a lot of painting before, but sculpting is a different facet because there is a lot of um, an analysis that has to go into creating a, um, a sculpture. We talk about the armature, it's a three-dimensional prospect, and I just fell in love with it. And um, I was always talking to my university professors and asking them about, um, you know, do you know Power Paul? Do you use it in any of your um, classes and they said no. So I took some extra courses and also became a Pavlik Paul instructor. Okay. And uh, a couple of years later, I built my studio. And um, this is the beginning of a wonderful story and a wonderful life and a wonderful way of meeting very creative people. That's very so cool. I how, how long ago was that? I became a teacher four years ago. And it was uh, Lee St. Cyr who was my teacher. Aha, uh -huh, I know her well. <laughs> I also met Beverly at one of our classes. So. Oh, that's so cool. And, and yeah. I believe Liz is actually your neighbor. She's also in Quebec. She moved, but she yes. was there, right? No, she still is, yes. She oh, good, still is. Good. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Now, you start teaching. What I like about your story is that I've been hearing this more and more that we retire and baby boomers then, on the second part of their journey, they actually look for things that give purpose to them. Would you say finding this type of art gave you more purpose in this part of your life? It does because it helps create joy with others. And I just find it so lovely to see people leaving my, my studio creating something that they never thought they would be able to create. And that in itself um, gives a smile to my face. And also when I sell some at my Christmas markets and uh, when I have my garden shows, the joy that people feel when they look at my funny little, uh, you know, for example, here my, my little, um, you know, <laughs> bird. And uh, I have a whole bunch of different whimsies and, and whimsy, whimsy just makes everybody laugh. Uh -huh. So, so um, I just, you know, I love it. And my granddaughter, when she comes into the studio, she, she is full of joy. She says, Omi, I, I want to stay here. You know, she's already mm -hmm. planned her entire life around working with me in the studio and wanting to help me. So oh, that's very cool. it, it's beautiful. It's just absolutely gorgeous. And there's nothing better than giving joy to people, right? Especially in times like now. Yes. Now behind you, 
you have the piece that you're going to show us on the tutorial, right? Tell us a Correct. little bit more about it. So uh, this particular piece is um, a, a torso of a, of a female bust. And what I like about this one is that it doesn't really need a strong metal armature. What I have done is I've created it with styrofoam. And uh, with the help of a, a solid base and a thick styrofoam, which is, you know, you can find at a building supplies shop, um, you can create something that is, I think, quite easy to create and still is extremely lovely. So I yes. have several. Very, very cool. Now, before we go into the tutorial, I actually want to show them a video you prepare about your garden, which I would love to have some tea there because it's so gorgeous. Is it yes. a big garden that you have? How, how is it? Yes, we have uh, the garden is approximately one and a half acres, but we have a total land area of about 11 acres. Wow. So a beautifully landscaped with a pond and a pool and, and many little corners. So it allows me to create and place all kinds of sculptures into the garden. And um, it's nice to showcase your sculptures that way as well. I find they when you see them in the garden, they just belong. Yes. And people can, they can visualize them, themselves having something in the garden. And here in the Eastern Townships, we're in the country. Many people have large gardens, so it's perfect. That is perfect. And what you just said, they can visualize. It's very important when we sell classes or art that they can yes. see what can be done with those pieces. And sometimes just having them on a table doesn't do the work. Yes. Yeah. OK, That's... so we don't have tea today, but ah. we are going to go. What, say it again? You're welcome anytime. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but I want to take all my friends right now to go through this garden. You're going, the Ant Garden. You're going to love this. Let's take a look. Hello everyone, this is Leanne Chakra. I'm coming to you from saint Etienne de Bolton in the Eastern Townships in Quebec, Canada. We have a lovely fall day. If you'd like to follow me, you could reach me through Leanne's Art, L-I-A-N-E apostrophe S, Art, A-R-T, on Facebook. Let's take a look at my garden sculptures. Here we have my ballerina. She stands approximately three feet tall Together with the stump, which is actually an older tree that we had chopped down, she's close to five feet tall. And um, I'm really happy with her. I had used a, um, a special mold for her face and uh, was very happy with the interior structure. The interior structure is made out of metal. I had welded some pieces together when I went to university. The only thing that I've learned in this particular piece is that when you drape a lovely fabric, try and either create a hole in the middle or use lace instead because water can accumulate. But apart from that, everything is just pretty. These two sculptures are part of my children's series. Carl, who has the ball in his hand, is about five feet tall and also has um, a steel structure inside that I created when I went to university. And then I have the little girl here with a cat. She's approximately three feet tall, but sitting is about two and a half feet. And um, I'm very happy with the results. She is wearing uh, jeans and clothing actually for my granddaughter that I repurposed. And uh, Carl here is um, wearing clothing that I ended up buying at a, um, a resourcerie, which means it's a used clothing store. This is Poppy. She's approximately three and a half feet tall, a sculpture that's sitting on a large, large stone that I rescued when we did some excavations. Uh, she's called Poppy because she has poppies in her hands. These are artificial flowers that are dunked into powder pot and then repainted. And uh, Poppy has been outside in the garden throughout all seasons for two years already. And she's really no worse for wear, which really is a great testament to powder pot and its products. This is my little corner of mushrooms. These red mushrooms with a white stem are 
called Glückspitz in, in Germany, which means a, a mushroom of good luck, or also Fliegenpilz. Here they're considered poisonous, I believe they might be, but it is uh, a beautiful color against the green in the garden, and I've had a lot of fun making them. The large mushroom is five, stands five feet tall, and um, the inside of it is an old CD rack that I repurposed as the armature. And the smaller ones have plastic containers in, inside for the volume. And then I've, of course, used Pavapol and uh, Pavaplast and many different cottons and so on in order to stabilize it. These two sculptures are near the pond because they do have a water feature. I have my fisherman who is sitting about, he's about 19, 20 inches tall with, um, you know, the standard type of Pavapol material that we usually use. And then we have my mermaid who is approximately 40 inches tall. She's sitting on a tree stump and uh, I put a lot of effort into her. You can see that she has uh, detailed hands and um, quite a lovely face. Her hair is made with cotton and I've attached some seashells to her. Here we have my little road runner. He is um, actually, the armature inside is made out of an old piece of metal that used to hold a satellite dish. And what I did is I repurposed it and uh, made a bird out of it. This is Victoria. She's one of my first large sculptures and uh, I put a lot of effort into her. So I learned a lot in the process. Um, she stands over five feet tall and uh, has chicken wire under the skirt in order to give that billow effect. And um, the face I made out of a mold that I had created and the arms, the smooth finish on the arms was a mixture of Pavapol together with an other material that I had experimented with that I got at university. So it actually worked out pretty well and um, I might use it again. Here we have the um, back, again reinforced with metal and basically an old tablecloth for it. There was a lot of pins in this particular piece because of the um, flowers that I had to attach and uh, the way the skirt was billowing up. But all in all, I'm very happy with this particular sculpture. And the color has been great from the start. This sculpture is called Sakura, which means cherry blossom in Japanese and she's a sculpture that stands four and a half feet tall and was inspired by the bow that I had received from a friend of mine who had given it to her granddaughter for dress up when she had come back from Japan and once her granddaughter grew out of this dress up period uh, she gave me the bow and I said well let's make a geisha out of it so here she is the um, material is all cotton and viscose and of course uh, the hair is made out of cotton and artificial flowers. I hope you've enjoyed this little excursion through my garden and uh, do feel free to get in touch with me anytime you like through Leanne's Art on Facebook or Instagram. Have a wonderful day. What a gorgeous garden and what gorgeous pieces that you made. That's amazing. That's amazing. So you've made all of them in the last four years, I would assume. Absolutely. And the, the tall one, Victoria, is one of the first ones I made. I spent a whole winter creating it and um, it just, uh, you know, was able to, to feel joy when we're ensconed by, you know, 20, 30 inches of of snow and it's cold outside, the best thing to do is, you know, encapsulate yourself in a studio and start creating. That is true, that is true. But the other side is that you live in a place with extreme weather, 
Like I do yes. here in Utah, we have very cold and then very hot. And sometimes when we tell people, you can make these and put in the garden just like you would with a bronze sculpture, they don't believe that they can withstand that range of temperature. Absolutely. And it's, and it's so funny because when I do speak to some of my clients who have bought pieces, just recently they said, well, I brought my sculpture back into the house. And I said, well, you don't have to. Oh, but you know, she's so beautiful. I don't want anything to happen. <laughs> but I, I do sculptures that stay outside uh, all, all season long and uh, nothing happens to them. So it's wonderful. That is cool. I want them to know more about your pieces. But before we watch the tutorial, tell me a little thing. You give classes, in-person classes. How often do you give those classes? I give those classes on demand. Um, because of the pandemic, we were kind of locked away for a while, but just over the last couple of months, I've been giving regular classes once a week. And uh, people can always get in touch with me through my Facebook page, which is called Leanne's Art, L-I-A-N-E apostrophe S-A-R-T. And uh, the best thing is for them to get in touch with me. Now that we're getting closer to Christmas, I will be spending more time in my studio preparing for my market. Um, but right at Christmas, January, February, when people want to do something and they're kind of getting stir crazy, I'll be more than happy to accommodate them. And how many shows do you do a year? I do approximately four to five shows a year, nice. three around Christmas and um, then a couple of them during far farmers markets in the summertime and then I have my open house garden show which is very popular and that is on two weekends in July. Very cool so I'm going to risk saying that you're busier now than when you were working with finance aren't you? Uh, no <laughs> because I was working six hours a week running a business um, but but um, it is a busy, it's a good busy this time. Yeah. It's a busy where I'm in control of my hours and if I want to be there until midnight, I can. And if I don't want to do something one day, I have the choice. So yes. that is the best way of being retired. You know, you found out before the pandemic what people found out during the pandemic, that sometimes we need to work with things that have a meaning to us even if it means a huge, a huge shift in, in, in the, the job market for us. But we need to go find things that give us purpose and they give us joy because it's not all about money, correct? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So what do you say? We watch the first part of the tutorial because I know my audience, they are all anxious to know how you made the beautiful piece. When we come back, we are going to show some of the pieces you have around you. Is that okay? That's fine, with pleasure. Hey, let's watch part number one. Hello everyone, my name is Leanne Chakra and welcome to my studio. Today we'll be talking about how to create a female torso that is standing approximately three feet tall. You will not need to create a wire armature in this particular case. So let's get started. Here are two examples of the female torsos which we're going to be talking about today. Um, both of them have been dipped into bronze pavropol and they also have a layer of pavroplast. The skirts are made out of uh, cotton and uh, the torso or the corset has cotton as well as a lace overlay. Here we are looking at the backs of the two torsos. As you can see one of them has wings, the other does not. Uh, one has more detailing in terms of a bow. The other one has the wings, as I mentioned, a nice knot. And both of them are billowing out. And I'm going to explain to you how I achieved that in the next little while. So let's take a look and see what we're going to need in order to create this particular sculpture. I have chosen a brick that is about 10 inches long and 6 inches wide and I've drilled two holes in it in order to be able to put in my rods. My rods are 5 eighths of an inch in depth and I'm going to attach them with pavroplast in order to make sure that they're solid. If you prefer not to work with um, bricks, you can also buy 12 inch long nails and anchor them into 
a mixture of, of concrete and then let it harden. That works really well as well. Apart from that, we're going to need a pen. We're going to need measuring tape, a exacto knife in order to cut the styrofoam, a styrofoam ball in order to shape the breasts if that's how you like to do it, a piece of styrofoam that is two feet uh, wide and uh, two feet long and one foot wide and we're going to be drawing the outline of the torso onto this piece of styrofoam. Alcan foil and what I've also uh, used is some aluminum mosquito netting. So this is mosquito netting that is made out of aluminum not plastic and I'll be able to use this in order to help billow out the skirt and then attach it to the waist of the styrofoam torso. And make sure it is aluminum, not plastic, because plastic I don't think would really go well in, in our weathers if we want to keep them outside. But mosquito net netting is always good. We sometimes leave our mosquito nets out all winter long, so I have really no worries about that. Apart from that, we're going to use some cotton in order to make a skirt, have some lace on hand in order to finish it off, and our old standby, always some cotton, because uh, cotton t-shirts, because they're really the most important thing when it comes to our Paverpal. What I would suggest um, is to use a one liter container of Pavapal. That should be enough. This is a larger sculpture, so a little half liter container will probably not be enough. Step number one is going to be attaching the base to the styrofoam armature. So I have here my two pieces of rods that are five, sixteenth of an inch in diameter and I will fix them now with Paverplast. I, it's a pre-mixed Paverplast that I had in reserve and it's basically the consistency of whipping cream. So, um, you know, I can't really tell you the ratio because I just go according to feel. And then I also have some Paverpal in bronze and I'm going to dip some of the strips in, into it in order to wrap it around and attach it into the styrofoam base that I'm going to, um, that I've, where I've already drilled, drilled some holes at the proper diameter in distance. The distance between the two holes is approximately six and a half inches, and I've drilled the same distance onto the styrofoam here, so we'll be putting them on afterwards but first number one is first to affix the rods so number one is putting some of the paverplast into the hole um, as we know paverplast is like a great glue and what it will do is it's going to make sure that the rod will stick nicely so I'm going to put in one batch of Paverplast and then I'm going to cover the rods as well with Paverplast and um, add some cotton onto it and then affix it into the holes. While we are waiting for the rods to dry nicely and tightly into the cement, we're going to start working with the styrofoam armature. Here I have designed and outlined already the, the shape of the torso and I'm going to give you some of the details. So let's take a look at the outline of the torso and uh, how we're going to cut away on this styrofoam panel. The first thing to do is to create a center line and this center line is six inches on each side goes all the way down in order for us to keep the proportions. We will design one and a half inches for the neck width and one inch depth, which means that you're going to be having three quarters of an inch on each side of the center line. You go down one inch. This being one inch, we go down another inch in order to find the line where the shoulders are going to 
end up. The shoulders, the width of the shoulders is going to be 10 inches wide, which means five inches from the center line. From the center or the beginning of the neck down to the waist, we have a total of seven and a half inches. Or if you want to measure from the top, eight and a half inches in order to find the waistline. The waist is going to be four and a half inches wide, which means two and a quarter inches on each side. From the waist point down, we're designing, um, where we're measuring another 10 inches, and we measure 10 inches across, and this is going to give us the outline of the skirt. Now, we still have several inches going to the end, about five inches, and that's fine because we're going to be putting the rods in here, and then after that, we can still cut away and shape the actual torso. We will now start to cut through the styrofoam and follow the line. And what I do is I do it a little bit at a time in order to make sure that I don't make a mistake. We can always cut away a little bit more later on. So the idea is now to follow. and make sure that we cut deep enough into the styrofoam. What I usually do is I go in first a little bit more shallow, and then after that I start to go a little bit deeper. And when you go in deeper and you have a blade that is a good inch, inch and a half into the material, you'll be able to block or break off a piece very, very easily. So here we have the cutout outline of the female torso. We'll now be shaping the edges and continuing to shape it before we attach it to the cement base. So I've cut down my styrofoam torso and also cut off the edges in order to give it a bit more of a rounded form. The fullness and the roundness is going to come from some aluminum foil that we're going to attach now to the torso itself in order to give it the female shape. So we're using aluminum foil now in order to round off the neck and in order for it to look like an antique kind of torso that could have been found somewhere in Rome and we're going to continue doing that with um, the upper torso up to the waist because that portion is the one that is going to be exposed to the elements and is also going to be exposed because we're going to dress it up. The bottom part, this part here of below the waist is basically going to be hidden by cotton. We will still um, powder pull it and uh, cover it with some cotton strips in order to make sure it's waterproof, um, but it really will be hidden from view. While we are adding aluminum foil to the body, we'll also start adding the chest. So what I have here is I have a two and a half inch diameter styrofoam ball that I'm going to cut in half and then attach to the front and that will help me a bit with the volume. We probably will still add a little bit of aluminum foil but at least it'll give us a start. An easy way to attach the breast is to use a toothpick 
and uh, insert it into the styrofoam. I'm going to do that on both sides. And if it doesn't work out, you can always take them off again and replace them in a different format. But I think these seem to be even and quite nice. So what I'll do is I'll continue with the, the foil in order to give it a bit of a smoother finish. As we know, we never have breasts that are this perky. So we're going to add a little bit more foil all around. So here I have applied the aluminum foil and I'm going to start ta taping the whole body with hockey tape. The bottom part will not be taped with hockey tape. I'm going to use the cotton uh, dunked into Pavapol because we don't really need um, to put an extra layer on top of that. Um, this is styrofoam that is used in construction so it is uh, waterproof and uh, I know that it's going to be fine outside. So the next step again is going to be covering the upper portion that, ex that is exposed with aluminum foil with hockey tape and then we will reevaluate the shape of the torso and make corrections if need be. So before adding the first coat of Pavapol onto the torso and covering the rest of it here with uh, dunked in cotton strips, we can always evaluate to see whether we're happy with the shape. And uh, some of the tools that are really handy are either a spoon in order to smooth out some of the tape that we have applied or also a hammer if we feel that um, there are certain areas that need to be pushed in, etc. So I use that quite a lot. I found this little hammer and I think it's really, really handy. So just a little trick of the trade, either a spoon or a hammer in order to find out um, if there's any and evennesses, and then you can help smooth it out with that. So while we're waiting for the first coat of Pavapol that I've put onto the styrofoam dries, uh, we're going to start working on the actual dress and skirt. As I mentioned, uh, for the skirt to billow out, I've decided to use some mosquito netting out of aluminum and uh, we'll, I'll show you now how to go about that. Okay, I don't know about you, but I never saw that type of styrofoam before and I would say it's life changing in itself. That's so cool. Well, we are going to see part number two very soon, but here's the offer of today. And again, it's just while supplies last and why we are live. So today I'm going to be offering you the Powerpole Bronze, a thousand milligrams. That's the same that she is using in the tutorial and the Josephine Varnish. So if you were to buy both of them together right now, you would be paying $62.95. But guess what? Today and today only, it is 53.55 cents. 53, blah, 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 blah. $53.55, but it doesn't stop here, right? Not a Powercraft TV. Here you're going to get a random color of a very high quality acrylic paint that we are going to send it to you for free. Normally you would be paying $7.99 for that alone. So think about this, Powerpole bronze, uh, 1,000 milliliters, 
the Josephine varnish and a free big tube of acrylic paint for just $53.55. So there is a website going below the video and there is a box right here that you can click and get it right now. We sell these until supplies end. So don't wait too long, okay? Okay, Lian, before we go and watch the second part, because you know I like to keep them anxious a little bit. I want to see more, I want to see more. Inspire us with your art. Show us some pieces that you've made. So um, I have here, for example, something that I created a, a few times, and uh, it is a, a ring. And uh -huh. in it, um, we have a person reading. So it's basically what, what I would call a reading circle. And it's been very, very popular with clients because they can hang it into a tree. Oh, beautiful. And I took um, a couple of ideas out of it because creating a circle is not that simple. Um, but hey, maybe we can do a tutorial on that at one point. Oh, and, I would love that. <laughs> and then, of course, this figure is approximately the same as the standard Pava ball uh, figures of about um, 15 inches. And uh, well, the books, you know, there's many different ways for us to create a little book. So she's reading all about the Eastern townships in this one. <laughs> Very cool. And it is beautiful. So that's, yes. So she's a lot of fun. And then we have another one that I thought might be interesting because I've used different types of uh, Pavapol in her um, or some of the Pavapol products. So she is ready for a swim. <laughs> and um, this is black powder, Paul, but how I got her so smooth was basically um, with powder plus, but also using some rose clay in order to get the smooth oh, finish. And nice. the bathing suit is made with rose clay imprinted and then highlighted with silver. Oh, that's very cool. Oh, yeah, very so cool. That, that's a little bit different. That's yes, and I different. like... I like the chubby lady. We actually had some people during courses asking, all the figures are, I see are so skinny and perfect. Don't you make chubby ladies? And I was thinking, yeah. I'm a chubby lady. I'm a chubby lady. <laughs> I love them. <laughs> yeah. Very yeah. cool. I have, I have one um, at my pool, and she's a diver, and she's a chubby Ooh. lady. And um, everybody just adores her. They they think she's the the most the fun most fun. And she's been outside now for over four years every winter. Oh, very cool. Let's see one more. Maybe the one beside her. Okay, that one was inspired by. She was inspired by a photo I saw of a little girl who was picking. Um, leaves and you know in autumn everybody is out there picking leaves so this is a little sculpture that I made um, and she's got a purse and little leaves in her in her hands and wears a little hat so she she was kind of lots of fun to to, to make she's very beautiful yeah thank you, you. mentioned at the beginning I, for, for, first of all you have a tag on her show us what do you do? Is a way for you to show them or not yes, forget? Yes, so basically what I've done, and that's a very, yeah, I, I created this. I have a business card with mm -hmm. just my, my name, address, and my Facebook uh, page on it. And then on the back, I've marked down that it's a sculpture made out of, uh, created for, for winters and so on. It's safe for Canadian winters. And for more information, they can give me a call. So it's a way of promoting that's myself. Good. I can also you put, put the in price. all of them. Yes, and I do. And um, there is, uh, when you go to uh, one of the regular, the big stores, like, I mean, I'll mention Walmart now, there's, there, you can buy laminating sheets. So I can put my business cards inside of these laminated sheets and then seal them. Uh -huh. And when I attach this to a sculpture that is sitting outside it's not going to get wet and it's waterproof that's awesome that's an so, amazing tip yeah yeah so yeah i love the tips that you give uh, in on powercraft tv and all of your courses it's just fabulous what we learn so uh -huh. this is my little solution on on how to you know position it you can put your name on it and and so on and it works really really well 
that's very good. And we never know how far those cards will travel and the clients that they will bring to us. So, yeah, excellent Absolutely. tip. Okay, we are going to watch the second part of the tutorial, but when we come back, I want you to talk to us about the chaplain that you have behind you, okay? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so let's watch part two of this tutorial. So here we have the mosquito netting and I've already cut it. Basically, the idea was to fold it and then cut the wedges along on both sides in order to have more at the bottom and less in the front because we're going to weave it now together with a very thin wire and that will allow us to put it closer to the waist. So here we have the galvanized wire. It's a 24 gauge, very, very thin. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to weave through the little holes of the mosquito netting in order to be able to gather the material and wrap it around the waist. So here we have the underskirt made out of the mosquito netting in aluminum and I have attached the wire all the way through and I'm also going to work on the skirt. The skirt is made out of 100% cotton, basically a bed sheet that has been considered obsolete and it's cut 26 by 48 inches and we're going to also weave it uh, the same way and gather it at the waist in order to give the volume. So basically what we're doing right now is just gathering the material with a needle, pulling it through. And uh, this will allow us to have a beautiful full skirt at the bottom and some nice even pleats at the front and at the top. For the top of the torso, so the corset will be uh, basically a cotton t-shirt tube top. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to add lace as an overlay. And I have some really pretty lace here that um, is going to look lovely in um, on the top because it'll give a lot of uh, texture. So here we have the torso covered with two coats of Pavapal and I will make another coat of Pavaplast and apply it in order to make sure that it is really truly waterproof before adding the dress. The Pavaplast mixture that I've created right now was half a cup of Pavapal with two tablespoons of Pavaplast. And as you can see, it's a fairly thick mixture. And I'm going to apply this now to my torso in order to give it a really great weatherproof finish. We are going to now attach the underskirt that is made out of mosquito netting to the waist of the torso and then twist, twist, twist in order to attach it. And then after that, we're going to arrange it nicely so that it will pull together properly especially in the front, because what we want is we want the volume to go on the outside and make sure it's pleated where we like. What you can do is on the back, attach it with some hockey tape so you have a proper loop that's closed. So that's going to be the next step. Once you're happy with the way the, the underskirt falls, you can start dunking the skirt that has been created out of the cotton sheet into Pavapol and attach it. 
Dunking the cotton fabric into Pavapol is always one of the messiest things. And when you start working with larger sculptures, it definitely is a challenge. So I have my six liter bucket here, and um, this is what I use in order to be able to accommodate the larger pieces. It's even more of a challenge when I start working with a five foot sculpture. But um, remember, you need to work every piece of the fabric and uh, make sure that you massage it really well so that it's really well covered. And uh, the next step is going to be to really attach it to, to the structure and always make sure that you squeeze out as much as possible. If not, you're going to have a puddle at the bottom and that's really a waste of the fat material and it's quite expensive. So you want to make sure that it's where it's supposed to be. So now what we're doing is we're going to be placing the fabric, giving the volume where we'd like it to be. And in this particular case, I'm going to make sure that I'm going to tuck the skirt in back onto the stone um, in order to ensure that I don't have little crit critters making a home on the inside of the sculpture. <clears throat> so once you've applied it, it's a matter of arranging the folds and going around and working the skirt to get to be the way you like it. As I said, in my particular case, I'm having it billowing out and then back onto the stone in order to not have any cavities where little critters could go and nest themselves. Now we're going to work on the front, the top, part and I'm going to apply I'm going to apply now the tube top that is going to be covered afterwards with a nice piece of lace and then we're going to put a lovely belt around in order to finish off the sculpture. Applying the lace on top of the tube top is what's going to give us this wonderful finish. And once we do the dry brushing, um, you'll see that it's just absolutely gorgeous because we'll be able to see all of the beautiful different types of highlights that, that, the, that the lace is going to give us. So here I have now applied the lace top and a small little belt that I cut out of lace and um, a skewer from a shashlik type of, uh, you know, wooden skewer is a good idea or a toothpick also in order to just arrange the fabric and if you find a little piece that you don't want where it is, just tuck it in or uh, remove it, depending on whether it's loose or not. It's uh, always a good idea in order to work in making sure that everything is as pretty and as clean as you would like it to be. I'm going to add a little bow here on the back now. Um, but I'm quite happy with the way the lace looks as well as the skirt. Here you can see the little bow that I've attached and inside of it is a plastic wrap that I'll be able to pull out um, in a few hours. I just wanted to make sure that the bow ends up being nice and puffy so we'll be able to move it out. Plastic wrap is a great item to have because um, you can billow things out with it as well and it doesn't really adhere to power Paul so um, it's not going to be there permanently. If you want to speed up the drying process you can always use 
a hair dryer or if you have another drying uh, item that would be good too. I happen to have a hair dryer. I'm putting it on high, but usually I, I'll put it on low, but it's a way of drying it up a little bit faster in order to be able to apply the second coat so we can do some dry brushing after. So let's have a look at the female torso with two coats of Pavapol on the dress. The only thing that is needed right now is to wait for it to dry and then we're going to do some beautiful dry brushing in order to get the highlights. Just to get back and see what the other ones are, here we have some that are dry brushed with bronze and gold and silver and uh, maybe we'll do something different this time around. Oh, exciting, right? It's taking shape and when you think how big the sculpture is and how gorgeous it's going to look in your garden, woo, you will just want to make several of them. But never forget, you need the supplies for that, right? So today we have the Power Pole, a thousand milliliters in bronze, like she's using on the tutorial, the Josephine varnish that is very handy all the time, and we are adding a free acrylic tube, very high quality, very big, that you're going to love. You're going to receive random colors. If you were to buy the Power Pole and the Josephine varnish, you would be paying $62.95. But today, and today only, $53.55. I will repeat because you're about to have a heart attack. Oh, really? I'm going to save all that? Yes, you're going to pay $53.55. You're saving on those two products and getting for free a large tube of acrylic paint. So you're going to be creating many, many garden sculptures. So you don't want to miss this promotion while supplies last. The website is rolling below the video. And of course, we have a box here on the site as well. If you are in another country, there's a website also for you to take a look. Okay, it is time now for us to get to know more about one of the products of the PowerPoint line. Hi, this is Danielle with Curious Mondo, and we're going to cover Paver wrappers that are a fabulous component that combined with Paverpol to create unique and wonderful detail to your sculptures. So let's take a look. So what Pava wrappers are, are these fabric viscose, which means that it is derived from wood pulp and then treated and spun into a fabric. So it is soft and it's lightweight and it drapes very well. So I'm going to demonstrate what, how you would dip it into Paverpol. So I'm going to move this aside. Move this over here, and because I don't want to make too big of a mess, so you just take your Pava wrapper and you dip it in and get it nice and coated there. You want to make sure you get all the sides. If you miss some, just keep dipping until you get it all covered. And then I just squish it down here to remove the excess. Give it a little bit more. And I'm wearing gloves just because I'm funny about messes, but you can actually use just your hands because Paverpol is non-toxic. So that is a wonderful thing. So what you would do is you would kind of move it around here and then you would dry it. So you can let it air dry a little bit on a piece of plastic or, or wax paper. You could also use a hair dryer to speed up the process. And then you can wrap it around wood, you can wrap it around metal, if you have a base. You could make hats out of this, you can make clothing, you can make wonderful ballerina skirts, and just add it around on your sculpture. Whatever you can come up with. There are so many possibilities. So that is how we work with Wrappers. Thank you so much for joining me. Okay, Leanne, the chopping. Yes. 
So you're you're looking at this this item, right? Yes. You're talking about the uh, large sculpture. Now, um, I just love elegant ladies, and um, you know when you think about Roman sculptures, they are often just have a torso, the head is gone, and uh, and that's what inspired me really to think about how to create a torso. So as you can see on the video, the inside here is styrofoam. And then what we've done is we've covered it all with aluminum foil. And then of course used our, you know, hockey tape that um, I don't know if everybody around the world is able to get, but we definitely in Canada have a hockey tape. <laughs> I, w I would be surprised if you didn't. <laughs> I know, and going to the hardware, I'm sure they're wondering why there's so much hockey tape being sold yeah. lately. Late. <laughs> that is true. So uh, here is a little different because of the fact that we wanted to keep the volume on the skirt, and that is the reason why I, would, I was talking about the aluminum netting. Um, I find um, it's a little bit finer, and it uh, helps keep the shape. I have made other skirts by putting paper, uh, plastic bags underneath in order to keep the volume. But um, here I find, because we're going to put it outside, I just wanted to make it a little bit more stable. Mm -hmm. And uh, here, so like I mentioned in the video, the upper part is a jersey material and then covered by some lace you know, doilies that our grandmothers used to own and, and whatever I receive, tend to receive lots of donations from people. Then uh, this is bed sheets that have been converted into a lovely skirt. And uh, then around here, again, it was just a piece of lace that I turned into a little bowl. Nice, very cool. And one of the things in terms of tips, and this is something that I think is really important when you're starting to look at large sculptures, is to make sure that the bottom is sealed. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I'm saying that is um, I had one incident a little while ago with the sculpture that was outside for a while and a, and a nest of, um, of uh, hornets ended up getting inside and I was able to flush them out. But you know, they find, you know, insects will find all kinds of little holes mm -hmm. to, to try and build inside. So this is something that's really, really important, especially if you're wanting to sell them, to make sure that you seal them properly in order to to have a solid piece and, and you know, maintain your your reputation as well as, as a quality artist. Yes, of course. And we tend to focus so much on the piece itself that it would be easy to forget about the base, but it's part of the sculpture, so he needs that attention. Yeah, yeah I find that, you know, three-dimensional three sculptures, the key to me is the, the armature. If the armature is no good, then, you know, it's very difficult to build. I have some great examples in my studio of one piece that was five feet tall and the torso kind of fell down um, because I didn't have that good combination, so I'm mm -hmm. still trying to figure out what to do with them. Well, but you know, from the things you just said, I think two things are great lessons. First of all, to repurpose things, like you said, bed sheets, doilies. I mean, it's a great way to not only recycle, but give a new purpose for those pieces, right? So that's a great part. And the other, of course, is always the problem solving and, and becoming better at what you do. So you started with the plastic bags, and then you thought, oh, oh, oh no, this aluminum, uh, Danny is life changing, right? And tomorrow it will be something else. And that keeps us engaged, the mind healthy. And problem solving yes. is a great thing for us to exercise. Yes. Show me more pieces. Okay, so uh, here, just recently we were talking and I noticed, noticed that on your, on your Facebook Ooh. page, people were talking about these um, little readers and I just created a whole bunch of them for oh. Christmas. So here's perfect one. gift. I have a couple of little other ones and basically um what the they other side. are is the other side. Yeah there there. Yeah, this side. So um 
what they are, of course, is just small little metal, you know, armatures inside, little skeletons, and then working with paper. And uh, the bases are wooden bases from some um, from some string that I had. And I just oh. thought, oh, they're really, really solid. So why not try and use them? Great. So that's that, great. Uh, so they're, they're, and as you mentioned always about preparing uh, your market, you have to have some items that are not going to be too expensive. And then you have one key item that is there in order to attract attention. So you can show that there is value in, in what you do and trying to find a nice middle ground. So exactly. that is um, how much would you sell them for? Yeah, I'm still thinking because, you know, they're small, but they're difficult to make <laughs> because <laughs> the paper is not really simple to, to work with. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to try and stay under 50 Canadian dollars with it, but I'm not sure. Maybe I'll have to go a little higher than that. Uh -huh. But, you know, they're, they would be a, a cute little Christmas present. There would be an awesome Christmas present. What about the yeah. lady that we are building for the garden? What do you think would be the price point for that one? Well, I, I don't think I'm charging enough, mm -hmm. honestly. Um, I think she should go probably for around 350, but I sell her for around 250. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a husband who is always telling me, don't undervalue yourself. You have to go out and, and put up the prices. So I am doing that slowly, but I feel I also need to build up my reputation beforehand. So that is always the problem with artists. I think we we tend to undervalue what we have and you know our capabilities. So that's that's still a bit of a challenge for me, I have to say. It is for many people. Uh, the, the, I was having this talk with somebody that works here today. Talking about money tends to be very difficult to all of us, but we need to be comfortable if we want to create a business. I would times that for five, because it, it, look at the size and look of all the work. Yes. So yeah, yes. yeah, bump yeah. up those numbers. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I will, I will. <laughs> you know, I think when we buy art, the factor is if it's going to speak emotionally to us. Right, if we like the piece, if we see the perfect place for that, I don't think people will question how long have you been doing that and how many courses you have in the back. In back. I don't think that's relevant. It's more relevant to us to validate what we do than to other people. Don't you agree? Yes, absolutely. And, uh, and like you said, it's really about what speaks to the heart. Yeah. And if they have that it'll speak to the heart, they will spend the money for it exactly, because they just love exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. and one thing that we tend to do is judge everybody, saying nobody's going to pay more than this for this. And we don't know. We should ask for yes. what we think is really worth, right? Absolutely. Yes. That's cool. Yep. So, Leanne, mm -hmm. let's watch part number three because they're biting their yeah. nails. Okay, we'll be right back with you. Let's watch part number three. So here we have the torso again, and I had applied two coats of Paverpal, but I have to say that I'm not uh, happy yet with the, the amount of Paverpal that I have inside the fabric. I want to make sure that it's going to be great when we put it outside and as you can see some of the areas um, have soaked in a lot of powder pull and I don't have a smooth finish. So in this particular case we're going to wait another day. I will apply a cover of powder plast and it's going to be easier for me to apply it now because of the fact that it's pretty hard and solid. When, when you put or you try and put on a powder plast cover um, when it's still kind of wet as a second coat, it doesn't work as easily. So I'm going to add another a coat of powder plast just to make sure I have this beautiful shiny finish. And um, then we're going to get to the dry brushing. So here I go. I have decided to also add an extra layer onto the bodice 
Um, it might dull a little bit the, the lace, but it's not going to affect it too much. We'll still be able to get a really beautiful um, dry brush finish in order to see all of the beautiful details of the lace part. Um, but I just want to make sure that the piece itself is, is good and safe for outdoor use. The, the sculpture I've, of this type that I've sold in the past ended up staying inside uh, because that's what happens with most of my sculptures. People love them and they just don't dare keep them outside. But I have kept many of my sculptures outside even during the winter time. So I'm, I'm not really worried, but um, it's, it's a nice compliment to know that they love them so much that they want to keep them inside. So I'm going to continue working now and adding an, an extra layer of Pavaplast everywhere. As Lise had mentioned in one of her uh, classes a while back, it really is equal to, she said, close to 20 coats of, uh, of Pavapal. So it, it really is a, is a great way to protect your piece when you know you want to bring it outside. Here also just a little example on the bow. Um, as I had mentioned to you before, I have some plastic wrapping that I put inside of the bow, so I'm going to just pull it out uh, on both sides. Let's hope it doesn't come off. It could happen, but that wouldn't be a, a bad thing. But just seeing, because I am having a hard time um, pulling it all out. And uh, here we go. Uh, okay, so what I will do is I'm going to just add a bit more Pavaplast because it seems to not be sticking as easily. And um, <clears throat> we know that Pavaplast is the best. And it's also good to show some of our failures because that's the only way we learn. So here we go. This is going to be attached. And I was able to get some of that rounded shape on the bow that was uh, missing if I hadn't put the plastic wrap inside. So plastic wrap is our friend in many instances. We're going to let it dry now and uh, later on we'll do the dry brushing. And I'm still not sure what colors I'm going to use this time. I feel like uh, a bit of a change. So we'll see how that works out. So here we are with the um, with the torso totally dried, well, dried enough for me to be able to now apply the dry brushing. I'm really happy with the way the result is. And as I said, instead of using the colors um, that I've used on my other two sculptures, I'm going to do something different. So the first thing is going to be using some dry brushing. And what I'll have is I have a little bit of silver here and um, when we apply color to our Pavel Paul sculptures we just want to apply a little bit so um, a little bit at a time goes a, a long way and going across you can see that it picks up right away all of the beautiful beautiful highlights the folds and and all of the design so we're going to be working on that, trying to get um, a really nice color combination. I know that bronze is usually really complementary with green and gold, and it's just absolutely gorgeous when I use my turquoise. But I've already made two in that color, and I feel that I'd like to have some variety because not everybody likes that. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a couple of different colors. And um, this is the first coat, so in the silver, and then we're gonna go and add another coat in a minute. The next color I'm going to use is a light blue. That should go really well with the silver. Um, so I've applied uh, one little coat of the, the silver. Now I'm going to apply the light blue. 
As we can see, it's almost the same. It doesn't really show up much, but I know I'm going to use a contrast, probably some sort of purple. And uh, what I've noticed is when I use three different colors, they kind of tend to blend well together. And um, it, it becomes a, a, a beautiful combination. So just let's wait and see uh, how all of these melt together nicely. And for the upper part here, I'm definitely also going to use some bronze uh, acrylic just because I, I love the way the bronze brings out the highlight of the of the bronze power pole. It just becomes gorgeous. So we'll just continue a little bit with the blue right now. So the next color is Berry. It's another acrylic color. I'm waiting for the power colors to arrive. I'm looking forward to it. They're on order and I should be getting them soon. Right now, these are just regular acrylics that I have. And then of course, I will always add a layer of the Josephine varnish uh, so that they can go outside. Let's see how this is going to work. You can always add back a bit of silver. I find that's a little too strong here. So we're going to you can wipe it away right away with water. If we feel it's too strong, I do that often enough. And there's nothing that you can really do wrong. I find um, we can always just add another color on top and uh, it will hide some of, if we make a mistake with one color. You know, I always tell my students to just go ahead and try because we can always undo whatever we do. It's not like oil painting or something else where we make a mistake and we can't correct it. Here we can always correct everything. Even if we do something wrong with the figure, we can add a bit of rose clay or some more aluminum foil, and then we can just fix anything that we feel we're not happy with. So I, I like the pink, but I think it's a little bit too strong, this berry. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a little bit of light blue again on top. And that is going to tone down this bright color. And um, I'm quite sure it will look really, really nice afterwards. So I'll show you, I'll show you when I add the other blue, how it ends up turning out. So what I love about adding three different colors and putting them on top of each, each other is there's a certain iridescence that, that comes, up, comes upon the, the sculpture. Um, it, it catches the light in different ways because of the different colors and just tends to sparkle. And I, I really love the, the effect of that. And um, the last thing we're going to do is, we'll, you see how the light blue tends to just tone down the, the berry color that, that I had used. And um, you could call it fuchsia as well, I guess. And the last but not least that we're going to do is we're going to add some bronze acrylic, just a tad, just a touch on the shoulders. And to me, that is really the finishing piece that I absolutely adore when I work um, with my, my sculptures. It's just the finishing piece. So, so here is the bronze that I'm going to apply. Um, probably even added too much onto this aluminum foil. But again, I'm going to dry brush it and it's going to be very, very thinly applied to the torso. 
So here we go. And as you can see, as soon as I apply really a thin, thin, thin coat of this bronze, it just brings the bronze powder pearl to light and it just shines. And I just love that look. You know, people come to us all the time. They think we're actually working on bronzes because of the color. And uh, I just feel that this enhances it tremendously. And if you want, you could even add a little bit in between, maybe inside the, the folds, not on the top, but on the inside of the folds, just in order to give it a little bit more depth. Just a touch. No need to go far with that. So here we have the finished torso. As you can see, um, it has a different kind of look compared to the other two I, I made. This one has more of a little bit of a pink hue. The other two that I have here in my studio, I'll have more of a gold and green finish. But uh, the way of making them is the same. This one has a much bigger bow in the back. Um, but it's been fun making them because, because of the fact that um, it gives me an opportunity to also work with some styrofoam. And this particular styrofoam, because it is very dense and it's two inches thick, it doesn't have all the little flakes that you get from the um, white styrofoam that we get in our power pole boxes when we have deliveries. So it's much denser and it's easier to carve. And I'm sure I'll be using a lot of the little leftovers for other pieces as accessories. And uh, who knows, maybe that'll be another show. I hope you've enjoyed today's video and you've picked up some ideas in order to enjoy power pole as much as I do. You can always contact me through Leanne's Art, L-I-A-N-E apostrophe S Art, and it's Leanne Chakra, L-I-A-N-E-C-H-A-C-R-A. Or my email address, LeanneChakra1 at gmail.com, L-I-A-N-E-C-H-A-C-R-A-1 at gmail.com. Have a wonderful day. Isn't that gorgeous? It's super gorgeous, yes. And now you want to make a ton of them, don't you? Think about this, this beautiful piece in your garden or in somebody else's garden and what's going to tell the story it's going to tell. It's very important. Don't forget, today and today only, while supplies last, you can get the Power Paul Bronze, 1,000 milliliters, the Josephine Varnish, normally $62.95, today only for 53, bloop, again, the five, 50, it's because it's so, it's such a cool price, right? 53, 55, $53.55, and you get totally free a bottle of acrylic paint, very high quality acrylic paint, random colors that we are sending while your supplies last. So you need to take action first, right? Don't overthink this, it's a very good deal in itself, plus you get the paint. The website is right below the video, or you can click on the box on the side. But do it, because or else you're going to be losing an amazing deal, and you don't want to do that, OK? Leanne, first I want to ask you, the pieces that are hanging on your wall, are they also your pieces? Yes, they are. Tell me a little bit about them. For example, you have a beautiful Charles Chaplin behind you. How was that made? You're talking about uh, this piece This guy, here? yes. Yes. Uh, this is one of uh, Lee's St. Sears uh, classes. Ooh. And uh, it's a, um, a porcelain finish. Very and it's good. made with all clear and napkins. Oh, so I don't know nice. if she's in uh, one of your uh, classes Not with yet. you already. But uh, that would be a really nice one. And um, Liz, you know, she's a wonderful teacher. So this is definitely a, a worthwhile class. 
to, mm -hmm. to participate. Very cool, very yeah, cool. That, and uh, then this is actually quite interesting. This was made out of a canvas and the frame is actually cardboard. Oh. If you take a look inside here, it's just the, the waffle part of a cardboard. And then what I did is I finished it off with lace mm -hmm. and uh, put paper towel all around the edges. Nice. And then here we have um, little roses that, you know, you can pick up at the dollar store. And then the torso inside was actually made with the, um, the paste that we make the rose clay. Mm -hmm. And I create my own um, silicone molds. So um, this happened to, you know, fit into the silicone mold and so on and so forth. So cool. that's this. Yeah. So yeah, it has so much quality. Yeah. I suggest cool. they should go and buy right away the five, five liter container and right? never because they are going to use it. <laughs> Absolutely. Very cool. And I underline that even this large one will might need a little bit more than the um, the 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 one liter container. So, so they should get two. So they should get two right away. Get two. Absolutely. Get two right away. Yes. Leanne, tell me a little bit more about your in person class. So. Do you structure different teams every time? How how does that work? You know, I I enjoy giving a lot of people flexibility. So my classes tend to be a little bit longer. They start at nine, they go all the way until four o'clock. But I'd say a lot of times they go until five. Um, they have the option also of using one of the faces that I've created. I've used the molds from Paverpal, but I have, I've also made my own molds of different faces. And um, it just kind of finishes the piece a little bit. So um, I haven't really gone into any heron classes or I'm thinking of creating some bird classes, but right now it's basically Paverpal 101. Some people will say, well, I'd love to make a mask can we do that? I said, yes, but I really feel if you do number Pavapal 101, which teaches you about proportion, it teaches you about <clears throat> how to use the aluminum foil, how to create an armature um, and, and everything, how, how many coats to apply of the Pavapal, what is Pavaplast, etc. It is a really good fundamental a class that will allow you after that to buy some Paverpol and then just experiment on your own. Yes. Whereas if I think that is, you know, a little shorter, I'm, I'm not really ready for that yet. However, yeah. didn't we see just recently a little uh, a shorter class that was the little lady that was on the um, sitting on, on the I think that was a two-hour class. It wasn't it part of Power Craft TV? We had the, the fancy ladies, yes, on the first episode. Yeah, yes, and and that's great because it's it's a shorter class. So if people uh -huh. want to do half, it it might be a nice idea. And <clears throat> I do have to do that, get into that a little bit more. Yeah, very cool. Very but right, cool. And you know, people have the choice of doing fairies and fishermen and whatever they like. That's very cool. Tell us again, people in Quebec, how they can get in touch with you. The best way to get in touch with me is through my Facebook page, Leanne's Art, L-I-A-N-E apostrophe S-E-R-T. And, um, or call me on the phone. I believe everything is on Facebook, so it's the best way. I do have a also a um, an Instagram page, but I must say that I use Facebook a lot more than Instagram. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much for being here with us. I hope to see you back here very, very soon. Okay? Thank you very much, Shahar. It was a pleasure. And thank you so much for promoting Pavapal and creating Pavacraft TV. It's a wonderful idea, and I wish you lots of success with it. Thank you. Thank you. So, success to all of us. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye-bye. Cool. It is now time for a business tip. Okay.
here's my business tip to you, and it's really two parts, but very easy to apply if you get into the habit of doing that. The very first one is to listen. Yes, we need to practice listening. We all think we listen very well, but usually that's not the truth. So when people give you either a compliment or a, a, a complaint, you will first need to listen what they are really trying to say. Most people have a very hard time actually communicating what they mean. So it's up to you to learn how to really read what they are saying to you. And then you analyze, oh, what she's really talking about is that I'm very attentive to details on my piece. So that's something that I may enhance or highlight when I'm selling a piece. I can use the proper words to highlight that. That's one thing that you can do with compliments, always analyzing and listening to exactly what what they are trying to say. That's the difficult part. And if it is a complaint, don't put the blame on something or someone else. Take a look at you first. For example, we tend to say, oh, it's the economy, it's the virus, it's the crisis, oh, people don't like to give tips, or people don't say what they want when they order, or whatever is the excuse. First, think about, okay, let's assume this complaint is valid, and let's look if I am doing something I could improve. Look around and really think what you could do better in that situation. Once you, you analyze that, you're going to, to see if that complaint is a valid complaint, uh, is someone or something else's fault, or if just people were complaining because they wanted to, because sometimes they do that and there is no real valid reason there. So you need to analyze, okay? But it's very important to understand that for all of us, it's kind of hard to assume that it could be our fault. This comes from where we are being raised. Let's like say at three years old, you were running around the house and you hit your foot on a chair. It's very common that an adult came at that point and said, bad chair, bad chair, right? And you stop crying, and then they kissed you and the pain was gone. Remember those moments? Well, they were good moments for you because you felt relief to pain, but at the same time, you were conditioned to think that everything that happens is something or somebody else's fault. So it gets very hard for us to be accountable for what we do. We may think we do that, but when you see the day-to-day -day thing, you really need to stop and analyze. Am I taking charge of the things and, and, and if I, it's my fault, am I assuming that uh, all the time or not, right? It's very important because then you can make improvements and avoid very bad mistakes. Let's go to a business that has nothing to do with art. For example, yesterday I went to a restaurant to have dinner with some friends. Well, the food was delicious, so there was nothing wrong about the food. It was phenomenal. The owners were very nice people. But you could see that there were many flaws in the process. From taking the order, she brought a big hand uh, notebook, writing down, and she was not very through with what she was writing down. The food took forever. There were many, many little things to the point that I could see we were the only table on that restaurant. So at the end, we start talking to them, and we found out, unfortunately, they are going to close. Right. When I was leaving, I was talking to my friend, who is also a business owner, and I said, that's the number one problem. We need to look into what we did wrong and fix it before it's too late. Now it's too late for them. But, you know, we can blame virus, economy, people, whatever we want. But if we don't have processes inside our business, if we don't document very well what people want, we are going to have issues because when we talk, we cannot prove what was said in that conversation, right? But if you take note, what size exactly of this sculpture do you want? What are the colors of PowerPoint I should apply on them? And have that documented, the conversation becomes clear and it's very easy to see if something goes wrong, which side is wrong. Got that? So listening, documenting everything you do, classes, selling products, whatever it is, and learning to be accountable when you are on the wrong side. Simple things to do, but they need a lot of exercise. Hi, everyone. Are you excited to start working with PowerPole? Then why not become a certified PowerPole instructor? The certification course is designed to help people earn a second income by hosting PowerPole classes. In the classes, you will learn how to use the PowerPole products, and you'll get to learn a little bit about the business side of things. This can be a life-changing and very fun experience. The Certified Teachers course in the US is an online course where you will learn how to use all of the PowerPole products. You will also build three different projects that you will later turn in for critique and certification. 
To learn more, go to powerpoleamerica.com. I hope you enjoyed the show today. Don't forget to join me next week to learn more and enjoy PowerCraft TV. See you then.